I thought it fitting to start this panel with Beyonce's Flawless. Yes! <laughs> like everybody on the stage and everyone in this room. We'll get to listen to some more of it later on. <laughs> thank you so much for an amazing YTH Live. Just want to thank you for your attention and for making it through the distance here and joining us, the closing plenary panel, your energy and engagement with us. As these sorts of panels always are, we know this is going to end up being an organizing session <laughs> afterward, a strategic revolutionary planning session, and we welcome that as well. And thank you to all of the people who helped us make this event happen, all the people who helped get me where I need to go, everyone else, all the people who helped get these slides together, the people who made our food, the people who were serving us throughout this weekend. Thank you so much to all of the workers who made this happen. Just think it's important for us to take that time. So let's go. The feminist movement has repeatedly been declared as dead by mainstream media, with frequent think piece obituaries asking, where are the young feminists? I'm sure you've read them, I'm sure you've heard them, I'm sure you've heard people ask you those questions. Or just where are the young people, even not just feminists, and I see a lot of them today. According to Pew, young adult women ages 18 to 29 are the power users of social networking, and 89% of women online use social networks, and 69% of us do that on a daily basis on average. And this has laid the foundation for the largest innovation that feminism's seen in the last 50 years, online feminism. Online feminism harnesses the power of online media platforms to discuss, uplift, and activate gender equality and social justice. It's my honor to moderate this panel as executive director of YTH and also a leadership team member of Fem Future, along with one of Fem Future's founders, Courtney Martin, who's on stage with me right now. And that and Fem Future, for those of you who don't know, is an experiment in movement building that develops solutions for sustainability and impact in 21st century feminism. I'm joined today by feminist catalysts Shelby Knox, Courtney Martin, Juliana Brito Schwartz, Chanel Matthews, and Emily May and Carol McDonald who've all been actively involved in making feminism more rapid, more consciousness raising, more accessible, more intersectional, more community driven, more mobilizing, more decentralized, more youth led, and more innovative. Please join me by welcoming them. Let's welcome them with a shout out. And now we're going to start with each of them giving a brief self intro and telling us what online feminism means to them. So Shelby, let's take it away. I am Shelby Knox, and I am a senior organizer at change.org, where it is my job to help people start, run, and win campaigns for feminist revolution. Uh, and I'm also on the board of Spark, a young feminist collective uh, dedicated to challenging and cha changing the way uh, that women are portrayed in the media. Um, and well, feminism, to me, um, is hearing your pain and your struggle in another woman's voice and suddenly realizing there's nothing wrong with you and nothing wrong with them, but something wrong with the world that's trying to make you think that there is. And online feminism is helping us make those connections faster to other women hearing your story uh, and sparking uh, the revolution, not just face to face, but um, in a global interface uh, of all realizing, wow, nothing's wrong with us, something's wrong with the world, so we're gonna do this together. My name is Juliana Brito Schwartz. I'm a contributor at feministing.com and a writer at my own blog, Latina Feminista. Um, I, most of my work focuses on bringing uh, Latina voices into the online um, feminist space and, and making sure that those voices are covering um, sort of feminist movements across the Americas, including the United States and Latin America, and sort of seeing those connections. So I would say that the future of online feminism for me has a lot to do with um, breaking down borders, uh, particularly national borders, but obviously cultural borders as well, and everything that sort of stops us from seeing the, the similar, similarities and continuities between the movements that we're all working for. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for having me here. Uh, my name is Emily May. I am the co-founder and executive director of Hollaback, um, as well as a proud board, me board member here at YTH. Um, so 
Uh, Hollaback is a global movement to address street harassment. That's sexual harassment that happens in public space. Um, and we pair digital storytelling with on-the-ground action to make the revolution go down. We started in New York City when I was uh, 24 years old. Um, and now we have scaled to uh, over 71 cities and 24 countries in 14 different languages. It's been an awesome thing to be part of this movement that has literally exploded since I started doing this work nine years ago. And I think a true testament to the power of online feminism. Um, and for me, the, what I love about online feminism isn't, it, isn't just that we're you know, doing the same work in a different space, but that I think that online feminism is really allowing us to realize opportunities that historically we haven't had access to. I think for a long time we dreamed of grassroots leadership, but when it came to who had access to the media, there was ultimately very few faces there. Um, and now we're able to really actualize that vision of grassroots leadership, that vision of decentralized leadership in a whole new and powerful way. And it gives me hope um, for the future, because I think that the faster and the better we can organize and the more we integrate um, online feminism into feminism, uh, the quicker the revolution will go down and we'll all uh, be safe and free to be who we are. Awesome. I love these answers. I just want to be like, co-sign everything that was just said. That was awesome. Um, I'm Courtney Martin, and uh, I'm an author. I've written uh, five books among them, Perfect Girls, Starving Daughters, and Do It Anyway, The New Generation of Activists. Um, I'm also one of the um, editor emeritus at Feministing, so so happy to have the next generation here. Um, and as Jimia mentioned, uh, the co-founder of FemFuture and um, the co-founder of another organization called Solutions Journalism Network that is trying to shift the culture of journalism to cover what works and how, not just what doesn't. Um, and that really connects to me about this question of the future of online feminism. I think I'm pretty obsessed with the moment of, of sort of how do we articulate what we are for, not just what we are, are against. Um, I think we've, uh, in large part, thanks to efforts like Shelby's incredible work, figured out really how to create a cost for sexism, in some ways for the first time, with a lot of very powerful people. And that, to me, is exhilarating. Um, but I'm not sure that we've yet grown into this moment of how do we also, after we sort of burn things down, build something in its place that can sustain all of us and, and sort of be this more feminist world that we all want to see. Um, I am also the mother of a four and a half month old daughter named Maya who is having a really bad sleep moment. Um, so I'm hoping I'll be able to put words together today, but I just wanted to throw that out because the personal is the political and I need some effing sleep. So that's just <laughs> for all of you. Hi everyone, I'm Chanel Matthews. I'm a communication strategist with the ACLU of Northern California where I am tasked with creating visibility for the programmatic and legal work happening on the ground mainly reproductive justice, um, health and rights, and also LGBT rights, and some tech and civil liberties, so drone-like things. Um, I'm committed to online feminism, and what it means to me is, well, one, is it's kind of aspirational, my, what I'm gonna say, and also present, one, it, it brings together people like us to be able to engage in a conversation. I was telling Emily um, and Courtney that I actually hadn't met them in person, but I internet knew them, and so I felt like I did. When they walked up, I was like, we already know one another. We had actually never met before. Um, and so I really appreciate that. Also, as a civil libertarian, I am committed to it because I think it helps sustain and expand fundamental human rights for women and girls, and also reconstruct or um, continue our commitment to expanding democracy, and um, what would it look like when we work with organizations like Emerge who are committed to um, ensuring that women end up in the legislature, women and girls have an opportunity to participate in organizations like Youth in Government to be able to expand democracy using online feminism. Also, I'm a member of Echoing Ida, a black women blogging collective that is really working to lift the voices of black women or women from the African diaspora online. And so, you know, online feminism gives us an opportunity to be interconnected in that way. And, um, and so, so for a number of reasons, and I'm also um, hoping that one day it will help us to expand the socioeconomic empowerment of women and girls. We should not only be using online feminism to talk about our issues, but also we should own the communications tools that allow us to do that. Mm, that's great. That's great. Thank you. Hi, I'm Carol. Um, 
And I'm the director of strategic partnerships at Planned Parenthood Federation of America, uh, a place where I have now been, I realized, for 10 years this summer. Um, so that's a long time. And um, obviously, you know us as a reproductive health care provider um, with our um, 700 health centers throughout the country. Um, and my job currently, I come, I come to this work mostly out of political organizing, but for the last three years, um, my task has been to um, build more connections and relationships and do cross-movement work with in-plant parenthood and, and, and make us more, um, uh, make us more an, of an intersectional um, organization. Um, that's hard, Planned Parenthood is almost 100 years old and very large, um, but has really um, been committed to thinking about what the world is going to look like well, what the world looks like really today, 10 years from now, 40 years from now, uh, what kind of world we want to envision and how we need to relate to that world. So um, it's been really exciting work um, over the past few years. Um, I am also a mom and today is my daughter's fourth birthday. Aww. And it's the first time I'm missing it. So I have feelings about that. But when Jamia asked me to come here to talk about the future of online feminism, I was like, that is a worthy, um, that's a worthy endeavor. Um, because when I think about online, the future of feminism and the future of online feminism, I just look into her eyes. In what world do, do I want to see for her? And how do I want her to move in that world? Um, and so that, I think, is, um, is really important to share. When I think about what feminism means to me, feminism is, is liberation from oppression. And the, um, the tools that we now have at our disposal to get there like the online space, that is that literally can be the road to freedom. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm honored and excited to be um, a part of this amazing panel and all of you um, so that we can talk about how we're going to get there. Sorry, my mic over here is decided not to work right now. But I just wanted to say thank you so much and happy birthday <laughs> to your daughter as well. It means so much to me that each of you take your time and, and be here and share with us. You are the future of feminism <laughs> um, and inspire me every day, really do um, inspire me in all of your actions through your love and your service. So this question that I'm going to start our conversation off with now is a question for Carol and Shelby specifically, but if anyone else wants to chime in. Um, just because we have a short amount of time, I'm targeting some of the questions, but everyone in this panel could answer each of these questions beautifully. Um, what's the next frontier in online feminist activism? So what kind of vision do you have for a long-term continuous strategy within the movement beyond some of the existing methods that we use, um, including petitions, Twitter, and email alerts that have been effective? Do you have any visions for what the next step is going to be? Oh, that's a big question. Um, I, think, um, I think a little bit of it has to do around um, creating spaces to share our stories. Um, I mean, we, as an organizer, you know that storytelling is powerful, and you know we've been using that for, um, for a long time. So that's not anything new. But the kinds of stories that get elevated, the kinds of stories um, that um, uh, you know that are in the space, I think are really important. So for me, I think um, continuing that that, that storytelling um, element, I think, is 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 critical. And one of the things I've um, just uh, very recently that I have found so powerful is um, Plakovin in particular and the way that, I don't want to say reclaim because I don't think that that's the right word, but the way that, that black women have just owned feminism in the <laughs> last year and, um, and held Main Street, I come from a mainstream organization, so I can say this, right? Have held Main Street white feminism accountable to some of its shortfalls and um, some of um, some of the well shortfalls. That's good enough. You know what I mean. Um, um, and, and some of the ways that feminism has not been inclusive and elevating our own stories as Black women has been so um, I think radical and revolutionary and um, an opening for for me personally and I know for um, for many women overall. Um, and so I just look forward to to more of that. Um, yeah, so I think I'll, I'll start there. I think that the, the future of feminism is sort of um, rebuilding, 
uh, tearing down what is wrong with our movement, um, understanding why for many people who don't have the privilege set that I do as a cisgender white woman from America, feminism is not a safe or useful word. Um, and so talking about those things, having those difficult conversations in online spaces and offline spaces, um, holding each other accountable, but in a way that is building community. Um, and I think that that is something that our generation uh, is doing in a lot of ways, in a lot of mediums. And, you know, we're having conversations. I'm often asked, sometimes by older feminists, like, you know, you say you love this movement. Why are you trying to tear it down? Why do you say bad things about this movement? And I'm saying, because this movement has done bad things to people. <laughs> and if we don't say that, then we're going to continue to do bad things. And that's not the revolution that we want. So I think that that is, is, is a definite part of what our generation is doing for feminism. I also think that the story that Chanel shared about these, these folks having never met each other. I was at JFK Airport. Uh, I'm on the board of Spark. And I was m meeting two girls who had just come in from London. And I took them into the baggage claim. And Jasmine, Sierra. And they just like ran into each other's arms. These are two young women who live on different continents. They've never met each other in person, and they were immediately in each other's arms and had so many conversations. And now they're organizing a joint sex education campaign, one in London and one in Utah, and doing it together. And so I actually think that the future of online feminism is using these spaces that are consciousness raising groups that are giving us these communities and these friends to actually do offline organizing in our communities, but having that online support systems, trainings, and things like that, uh, so that we can take advantage of both the, the online and the offline at the same time. Oh, I love that story, and you know I love Spark. <laughs> so inspiring. So this, this next question is for Courtney and Chanel. What do you think is the biggest obstacle holding us back from equality, and how can we use tech solutions to change it? And then moreover, what kinds of innovations are you seeing out there that are inspiring you in that way? Sure. Um, so huge question again, obviously. <laughs> um, I, I think it's important to say the biggest obstacle between us and equality is systemic inequality, right? It's like oppression and very powerful people who have not woken up to the revolution. So <laughs> on the most basic level, that's our biggest obstacle. Um, but I think what I'm really interested in is some of the more maybe wonky technical obstacles, like one that I think Shelby and I have had some conversations about around, particularly in online feminism, how do we sort of lengthen the arc of engagement and create more coalitions between people doing this sort of work? So Again, I'm so moved by the cost we're creating for sexism in so many different ways, but too often I see it as sort of, you know, an awesome organization puts a ton of resources into creating costs for sexism with some awesome grassroots organizers on board, and then what happens, right? It's sort of like it kind of dies off, and then the next organization takes up that issue when the news cycle allows for it. And, um, and so I think that kind of like sp sprinkly approach uh, is not building the momentum that we need in order to to really get to that what are we for piece that I was talking about earlier. Um, so I'm really interested in that, sort of how do we coalition build around issues? How do we get less dependent on the news cycle? Because I think, mm -hmm. you know, it's frustrating that it feels like you can only organize around particular news moments when, you know, people always need abortions and people always need, um, you know, like, uh, college tuition help and you know there's things that we need to build that aren't necessarily going to make the news in any particular way at any particular moment um, so how do we become less dependent on the news cycle how do we work together and how do we once we get people on board how do we keep them on board to do multiple actions around similar issues um, and and sort of continually create a bigger and bigger cohort that is ready to go when there's um, an exciting opportunity to be had because um, I'm just, I, I'm feeling frustrated. It feels like we've learned, we've learned how to do it really well, this sort of one-time action, but we're all still kind of maturing into what does it mean to like both do this stuff on a longer basis and really work together. Because I think sometimes, you know, we're replicating each other's efforts and there's so little resources anyway that that's, that's really hard on folks. On, on the point of resources, I'll just say, I also think that's a big obstacle. Part of what Fem Future was trying to do is build this bridge between... Um, the allies in this country who do have a lot of money and those who are doing amazing grassroots work and online work, they don't know about each other. 
and it's a shame it's the kind of people that Jamia was talking about that get into rooms and say where are the young people and we're like we know a million of them doing <laughs> amazing work but how do we get these people to meet each other and share resources um, and that part I found incredibly difficult to do um, and I think is still part of the unfinished revolution is like how do we actually get the resources of of wealthy allies into the hands of young people who have their own resource obviously that's like even more important than money to offer which is all this brilliant thinking and energy and all the rest of it. Um, you know there's a lot of barriers that are external to us but some of them are also internal and so focusing on single issue areas and not thinking about the interconnectedness or the ways that our issues are intersectional can be very limiting and a huge barrier. Um, I work in repro justice and some tech and Right now, privacy is a huge issue, and big data, and these are all buzzwords that are happening, and they are certainly issues, but um, some civil libertarians and other folks have uh, you know, expanded on that at the expense of, for example, reproductive rights. So you know, thinking about privacy as an issue that affects women, which is really important, somebody may or may not be looking at your phone bill, um, but certainly some women's privacy is being invaded by being forced to have transvaginal ultrasounds before abortion, and we're thinking about privacy in a different way now. So, you know, we just have to be a little bit more nuanced in our conversations. And I also think one of the huge barriers is the call-out culture of the internet. Um, we don't really have an opportunity to have a nuanced and complex conversation that goes into a deep analysis in 140 characters. And we certainly miss a lot of things. And one thing that's tangentially related to this is, for example, the stepping down of um, Mozilla CEO Brendan Ike mm -hmm. and the you know the construct of you know we that happened on many of that much of that happened on the internet right okay Cupid was involved and a lot of other folks were tapping into that including women um, but there was a lot of confusion I think and misunderstanding about what the issue actually was and some people were calling it free speech and some people were saying it's an LGBT rights issue and it technically wasn't either one of those things um, but more or less about you know what happens when you live in a society where you are mercilessly and publicly held accountable for your beliefs when you're trying to deny somebody the same rights that you have um, and you know if freedom of religion and freedom of speech and all of that comes into play and in, you know public public and private sector and that's true for women in the online feminism sphere too and so I think we have to really be conscious about having a nuanced conversation not shutting people down and the internet does that sometimes you can shut somebody down in 140 characters and we just were talking about this before we were coming onto this panel um, then you have a whole you know cadre of people of your your Twitter friends who are you know shaming publicly shaming and hurting somebody else um, and there's no space to actually expand on that conversation. And once you do have the space, it's a little bit too late, like the damage is already done, and then how do you fix that? And that just exacerbates other constructs. And so being honest with ourselves, taking a moment to respond before we do that. So considering the internal barriers to, um, to online feminism and expanding that and the rights and, um, of women and girls, but you know, thinking about the external and the internal together, I think is gonna be super important to overcoming many of those barriers. Thank you so much for saying that. Uh, Courtney and I both had the pleasure of being a part of a retreat with Parker Palmer um, that talked about not having living divided lives and showing up as whole people as activists. And it was a very paradigm shifting experience for me. So I'm just so glad that you mentioned that um, and recommend that as a resource as we start to think about that, that issue. Um, so right now, let's talk about the shift from online feminism kind of being considered as focused solely on blogging to a shift toward what's being called hashtag feminism or hashtag activism these days. What are the challenges and opportunities that have emerged with the rise of hashtag feminism? And this is for Emily and Juliana. I think that hashtag feminism or hashtag activism is First and foremost, an incredible tool for measuring, measuring what everyone is saying about something. Um, I think that there's nothing more exciting than, you know, logging onto Twitter, opening it up, checking out some hashtag, and finding that, like, someone in Brazil, someone in Mexico, someone in, you know, in France thinks the same thing as I do. And I think that's incredibly powerful, especially for a platform that is becoming more and more accessible. So you're hearing more and more voices. That, and I think it's also a great way of monitoring those conversations and sort of getting a sense of how they're changing and how they're flowing and, you know, and having conversations with people that you may never actually meet. That being said, I think that there's, we have to sort of be careful and find a balance between what's hashtag activism and what's, you know, quote unquote, clicktivism. What's, mm -hmm. what's, and 
what is making real difference on the ground and what is something that's really easy to participate in and may not have the same kind of effects as you know taking to the streets or something like that I see social media and and blogging and online work as a wonderful tool for creating conversation and creating space for voices that aren't necessarily heard on outside of that and then for inspiring and catalyzing uh, work offline. I think that that is. I think that that is like the perfect marriage and combination that's going to help us achieve what we need. Thanks. Um, I kind of love hashtag activism, um, and I'll tell you why. Is I. You know, there's been a couple, many, hundreds, who knows? There's tons of hashtags out there, uh, but there's been a few that have really uh, opened my eyes to a lot of conversations that I might have not otherwise had access to. Um, Solidarity is for white women, being one of them. Um, Not your Asian sidekick. Um, On the street harassment front, there was a hashtag called Shouting Back that yielded, I think, 50,000 stories of everyday sexism that happens in people's lives. And I think that's pretty awesome. And I think what hashtag activism is to me is sort of like a modern day consciousness raising group. For those of you who are over 50-ish, you may remember what these are, where you know in the the 70s and 80s in particular, women would sit around and and share their stories and realize that they weren't alone um, and share that expertise. Um, And uh, and I think that a lot of what hashtag activism is doing is is people getting together, sharing their stories and their experiences. and creating cultural change. And what I mean by cultural change is that they are literally changing hearts and minds. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what's so awesome about it to me because you wanna change the world, you have to engage in cultural change. It is a very hard thing to do for activists a lot of the times that are seriously under-resourced. is a very easy thing to do if you are you know, a fashion brand or a you know, pop star. Um, so you know, we wanna change culture. It starts with changing hearts and minds. It gets people to that framework shift where they think like, oh, Maybe that thing I did was a little racist. Or, oh, maybe that thing that that guy said to me on the street the way here, that was harassment. That wasn't okay. Um, And when you can get people there and you can get people to kind of reframe their understanding of something, then you open up this whole other like universe of space in which they're like, all right, so now I know that I was street harassed and it's not actually my fault. So I'm going to tell my dad about it, or I'm going to tell my friend about it, or now I know that this thing that I did was a little racist, I'm not going to do that thing again, right? And so we start to, the world starts to change, and I think for me, what I'm so excited about with online activism, in addition to that power of decentralized leadership that I talked about um, in my intro, is the power of um, online activism to take on forms of day-to-day discrimination. I think that, you know, our parents' generation, it's a fantastic job of addressing structural discrimination as it exists in laws. Um, but I think that it is our generation's charge and responsibility to take on the day-to-day discrimination that people face. And I think that technology gives us the tools to do it in a un- historically unprecedented way. Can I? Yeah. Please. I want to add to that um, a little bit. I mean, just as an example of how, how a hashtag can change an organization. So. Um, um, after Solidarity for White Women came out, we actually had, I brought that to our senior leadership at Planned Parenthood, where we had a discussion about how we needed to, we needed to focus our advocacy and center it more around the experiences of our patients, mm-hmm. and not just what we were thinking of and cooking up as sort of professional, you know, sort of the professional organizing class out of Washington, D.C. We then, out of that, created a theoretical model for how we make decisions about what issues we take on, what, th- what questions we will ask, what levels in our organization we are then going to take that to, how we are going to resource our affiliates. And in fact, just before I came here this morning, um, I have to send someone my notes from our latest conversation around that because we need to finish our framework this week so we can um, bring it to, again, bring that final framework back to our organization next week. So that started a conversation internally that is now then changing the way that we make decisions and the way that we operate. Thank you so much for sharing that because I think it's a really good example of how paradigm shifting hashtag activism can be, but also about how institutions can model other 
solutions for institutions because sometimes I hear people say oh it's always just the way we've done it or it's just too hard it's too difficult but Planned Parenthood as an organization that I had the privilege of working at <laughs> I understand for them to be able to adopt that and roll that out to affiliates and to have that strategy be adopted is a good example of why the time is always now for us to do things better and to not just say oh tomorrow is a better time for us to be more inclusive so thank you so much for sharing that that makes me really excited and inspired so this question is for everyone. I, as an advisory board member of Hollaback, I think that Emily will definitely have some input on this. Uh, but I know that every single person on this panel has experienced trolling of some sort or cyberbullying just for being a woman in public space on the interwebs. I myself have experienced rape threats and death threats and had other people in my life targeted because I've just dared to say that I'm a feminist and that I want to be liberated from oppression. And I think that the hardest part for me isn't when it comes from people who I already just know are not on my side and are haters, but I think when it comes from people within our community mm -hmm. who promote a toxic culture of call-out culture and accountability um, that is destructive, it's more painful. So I'd like to ask, how can we move beyond this toxic call-out culture to a more healthy way of holding each other accountable and creating constructive critique that can turn into action and cohesiveness as a community? And also, how can we support each other and create more of a culture of care, a culture of care and compassion, um, even in the face of an onslaught of harassment and threats? I guess I'm supposed to answer that. Everyone just looked at me. Um, <laughs> I think that something that I've been thinking about a lot lately, and, and I'm sure all of you can kind of uh, relate, that I think about this nonstop. This is a really big issue for, I think, a lot of online feminists, is how do we find the balance between being kind to each other and, you know, but also holding each other accountable? For me, it's mostly about trying to make sure that we don't lose people in this conversation that we're having. You know, I recently had a friend who, um, who, who uh, did something that I don't even know exactly what it was, sometimes it's really hard to figure it out on Twitter, um, who got called out for doing whatever it was that, um, that they did, and who came to me and said, you know, Julianne, I'm, really, I'm just really lost because I don't feel like I have the vocabulary to defend myself or to even understand exactly what's happening. Like, I, this, I, I've been faced with so many attacks and things that I don't, but I don't really know exactly how to respond, and I don't really know what would be the best way to respond, what would be useful, what would be productive, and what wouldn't be, and that made me so sad to think, and then this person um, sort of closed down their Twitter account for a while just to take a break and sort of figure out like what needed to happen, and it made me so sad to think that we might, we could lose that voice. This person was doing incredible work, and they may have made a mistake, and that needs to be addressed, and I think that they've learned a lot, but I really hope that they come back, you know, and we can't always be sure of that, especially when, you know, we're doing this work, it's unpaid, we're doing it, you know, we always talk about this, like the third shift, you know, so you're doing it, you get home from work, you eat dinner, shower really quick, and then you go back to work, just, you know, in your bed, in your pajamas. <laughs> so, you know, if, if we have to create a culture where people can, can learn through this work, but also come back and sort of not burn out. Can I add, I, I just want to say that I think, I've been thinking about this a lot lately. You know, I've never experienced this. I don't even know what you're talking about, Jamia. <laughs> um, uh, but I've been thinking about this a ton lately because I think at the root, there's something here about conflict that is really deep and elemental about our capacity to have genuine, real conflict with one another as women, as feminists. Um, and and it, this really came up for me because something happened with a peer feminist and I called her on the phone. I was about to do the email and the, you know, that whole thing. And I was like, I'm going to pick up the phone, I'm going to call her, and I'm going to express that I really appreciated some of what she was articulating and some of it hurt my feelings, literally. You hurt my feelings. I'm going to use an I statement, right? Like, <laughs> um, and she did not call me back. And she emailed me and said, like, I don't think I can have this conversation. And for me, it felt so representative, A, my own discomfort of picking up the phone and calling her and just being like, hey, can we talk, even better in person, but we weren't in the same city. Um, so noticing my own discomfort and how rare that is for me to actually have the, ba the balls or the breasts or the ovaries or whatever to like <laughs> call someone and say, like, let's talk about this because um, I care about you and my feelings are hurt. 
And and of course, it's more than hurt feelings. So I don't mean to make it sound like it's about hurt feelings. And so it's about systemic injustice too. But it, at the root of that, this internal obstacle that Chanel was articulating so well, it is about hurt feelings. You know, it is about feeling like left out or trying to call people out, and not thinking that they're holding themselves accountable, and that's painful for you because of all the crazy wounds you have because of this screwed up culture, right? So there's very personal stuff going on here. Um, so my own discomfort and then her inability to have that conversation with me, it just felt so representative of something yeah. going on on a much larger scale. So I want to be committed to anything I can, both for myself to grow my muscle of genuine conflict where I'm really investing in other people and myself um, in person, on the phone, et cetera. And if we can figure out how to do it on Twitter, God help us. I don't think we can. Um, and also challenging my peers and creating any sort of spaces structurally, organizationally that I can for us to get better at that. Because I think it's part of um, what is, I, you know, the biggest obstacle is making us lose people. I had a friend during the Fem Future thing who, um, young woman of color that I've mentored kind of the journalism world, and she was so confused. Again, I so resonate with like, what is going on? Like, you dip out of Twitter for a second. You like don't know where to go to find the answers. But um, um, she ended up trying to engage and basically wrote me this long email that was like, Courtney, you know I've never quite identified as a feminist, even though like I care about everything feminists care about. After this encounter, I will never identify as a feminist. Wow. Um, this was just so toxic. I don't understand this shit. And mm -hmm. that's the end of the, the, ch the chapter for me. And I was just like, that is such a loss. Like, this woman has such an incredible voice. She's doing incredible work. She's going to have some real institutional power because she's so talented. And she's not going to identify with our movement. Yeah. Can I add one quick thing to that? I'll say um, we'd be doing ourselves a huge disservice if we didn't continue to have in-person spaces. Mm -hmm. The internet is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason why... Um, and this is a huge, giant assumption, so I could be wrong, but the person that did not call um, Courtney back but emailed her is the discomfort that we have about talking to somebody on the phone or face-to-face, -face, like what the internet does to us mm -hmm. in making us feel uncomfortable. We were yeah. saying that you know, a lot of the folks that we meet are, tend to be a little bit more awkward in person. They're, you know, they can do all the things on the internet, <laughs> um, but when it comes to talking to somebody face-to-face, -face, making that eye contact, having the genuine conversation with somebody, engaging with them one-on-one, -on -one, that that feels really uncomfortable. Um, we have to challenge ourselves to sit in rooms like this, and thank you to YTH Life for organizing this space because it gives us an opportunity to say to somebody, I feel this way about this issue, and have them, you can empathize when you can look somebody in their eyes. Part of my job is to media train people, so what does it mean to look at somebody and say, I feel this, and you're looking at me, you know, this is me. Like, I'm not, there's no anonymity of the computer. You have to look at me, you have to own me, you have to acknowledge my blackness and my, my potentially my queerness or like my gender identity. Like, you don't get to absolve any of that through the computer. So we have to talk to each other one-on-one -on -one and force ourselves to have the hard conversations, including the conflict um, in, in, in person spaces and not just on the internet. Yeah, and I just want to chime in. So at Hollaback, we've also lost site leaders because of sort of the interfeminist drama that happens. Um, and it's always so confusing to me. So I actually come out of the anti-poverty movement. It's where I spent most of my career. Hollaback was a side project until four years ago when I stepped up as executive director. Um, and uh, it was confusing to me because the anti-poverty movement surely has drama, but it, it doesn't feel the same as feminist drama. Um, and <laughs> It's a lot more about like how big is your budget, how many government contracts do you have than um, you know this other stuff. So, but um, but I do want to say what's weird about it is that there's so many um, there's so many battles that we have to fight, um, and at the end of the day, we're mostly on the same team. We may define things differently, we may think about things differently, and that conversation is completely constructive, which is why I love hashtag activism. Um, but you know, I'd love to people just like make a commitment to themselves. Like I am gonna run like three campaigns against like jerks before I run like <laughs> one campaign against like a fellow feminist. Like you run three campaigns against jerks. I think Shelby professionally runs campaigns and wins campaigns. <laughs> against jerks. If Shelby wants to like come after me and like thoughtfully be like, hey Emily, I think you need to ch check your activism. Like I'd be like, all right. If she even wants to like aggressively come after me, I'm like, okay, you take down jerks for a living. Like that's fine. Um, but you know, but for those of you who aren't taking down jerks, who see taking down other feminists as a form of activism, um, I'm here to bluntly say that sucks. Um, I don't think it is a form of activism. I think it actually stymies our movement um, as a whole. Um, and that 
is challenging. And I think it comes a lot out of the fact that a lot of people come become feminists out of an academic environment, that we all have that like click moment as feminists where we're just like watching TV and we're like, that's racist, that's homophobic, that's sexist. And then everywhere we go, we're sort of like racist, homophobic, sexist, right? And we're like really gratified in that like place in our activism because we can just see all the problems with the world and we want to tell everybody about them. Um, and that's awesome, but that, you know, culture of critique um, is still important but can um, inhibit people from building things and we need to build a lot more things to take down this big machine called sexism, racism, and homophobia. We need to build a lot of stuff um, and that's why I personally don't engage in a lot of these online you know, feminist brouhaha's because, um, you know, I just want to build stuff and I know if I listen too hard, it'll, it'll kind of silence me a little bit. Um, and listen, not even listen too hard, I do listen pretty hard. I just don't engage. I don't like step in and say, I'm here, let me tell you what I think about this. Um, I, but I do, I do think listening is an important, is an important thing because even like through the anger, um, there's a lot, a lot of productivity that happens and a lot of hearts and minds that are changed. Um, but you know, let's not torture each other. Let's love thank each other. Thank you so much for that wisdom and like beautiful, <laughs> let's not torture each other, love each other. Tweet that. <laughs> thank you. So now it's time for Q&A before it's sadly time to say goodbye, which makes me very sad. Um, but we have wonderful people from Kim T. Van's team who are gonna do Q&A and bring the mics to you. So if you have questions, raise your hands, like you're partying, hey, thank you. <laughs> Hey, my name is Jenny. I'm from the Illinois Caucus for Adolescent Health. Hey! hey. Um, <laughs> I'm just wondering, since this is a youth conference, if you could each, maybe, or a couple of you speak about how you see youth being part of the future of online feminism. Mm -hmm. Good question. Yeah. I think I'm probably the youngest person on this panel. I can't quite tell. But um, I, I, I can s speak to that a little bit. I think that um, I've sort of maybe in the past year become very involved with this movement on a more sort of public um, level. And I think that there's just been incredible mentorship. I think that I, every single day that I talk to someone who's been doing this work for years, who's probably listening to me talk about something that they already dealt with like four years ago and really just don't care about anymore. I've never felt patronized. I've never, I've always had spaces to grow and learn. I've had people sort of walk my hand, or hold my hand and walk me through sticky issues like we were just talking about. So I think that spaces are definitely being made and sort of there's a lot of wonderful room for mentorship. Um, and, and you know, I just, I have so many people who have kind of raised my voice above theirs because they know that sometimes youth is, is maybe more important even if, even if there's a lack of experience. So I'm really grateful to that and I would really encourage other people to reach out um, and be the youngest person on a panel. <laughs> I, I can't see y'all so if I don't want to talk I couldn't put my contacts in this morning, so I actually can't see anybody, so I hope I'm not talking. <laughs> um, well, I want to say in this question what I really wanted to say in answer to the last, which is um, that Gloria Steinem once reminded me, she just turned 80, and I feel like I've been in the feminist movement forever, um, which I have since I was 15, and now I'm 26, and um, so, but she was like, you're gonna have to be around these people for a really, really long time. <laughs> <laughs> so build the movement and build the relations that, that you wanna see. Um, and I actually think my Spark girls, the young women that I mentor, um, I find them fascinating because they're actually not doing this. They're actually not in these sort of feminist brouhaha conversations. Like they're having their own conversations, but um, it's, it's in different spaces, first of all. So like Tumblr, um, I think there's a huge future uh, of online activism, but also um, creation of language and identities and how people express themselves, that's really fascinating on Tumblr. Um, I also think that the future of youth organizing um, is in this innate almost understanding of not just intersectional issues, but that all of our movements are the same. That like social justice requires that you fight homophobia and transphobia and that you are for immigrant rights and that you fight racism. Like all of these things, it's the conversations that I'm having with like teenagers these days who are organizers see all issues as yeah. feminist issues. And they didn't have to like read a lot of books to get there. Right. They were just there. And I think that is hugely, mm -hmm. like a great thing for our movement moving forward. And I just wanted to say one last thing for the next question, which is that I get the privilege of 
getting to know the writers at Rookie Magazine, and so some people between 13 and to people who are in their 50s, but we have this amazing intergenerational dialogue, and a lot of young teenagers that I'm working with, and the boss being Tavi Jevonson, who's 17 years old, is really wonderful because I would say that she always is very definitive about what she wants. She's always very kind and thoughtful and supportive of everyone. And I feel that she's actually one of the strongest leaders that I've ever had the privilege of working under. And one of our managing editors, Anahita Lani, who's been in many amazing papers and worked in all of these amazing places, has always said that Tavi is an amazing boss and the best boss she's ever had because she always wanted to work for someone who was smarter than she is and she hadn't had that privilege yet until now. And so I think it's really amazing to look at places like Rookie and those examples of young people who just decided to do it their own way. Like I said, um, Tavi has said that when she was thinking about doing this magazine, there were other people who offered to guide her and to fund it and to tell her how to do it. And she decided to go her own way and use the revenue that the magazine made to pay writers and not herself so she could own it herself and, and, and be able to not answer to anyone, shape it, and make sure that the content was up to standard and doing right by girls. And I really admire that and I think that we see more of that in this generation that, and especially even as I'm on the older side of the millennials, sometimes I wish I was born on the younger side because I too learned to ask for permission because I was raised by boomer parents who are kind of on the older side. And I'm just now starting to learn more about how asking for permission has never really helped me <laughs> all that much. And, um, and I think one thing that Gloria Steinem had taught Shelby and I both was power has to be taken and not given. Yeah. And so I've definitely, as a person in this body that I was born in, um, as a black woman, young one, a lot of times people like the representat representational approach of like what you do and that sort of thing. But sometimes it's important to also remind people that you have autonomy and you have actualization and you have ideas. and that those can be trusted too and that you really trust them and you own them and you're sure about them. So I think that would be my advice to young people is what Gloria told me because um, I'm at that point now and I think I'm, I have a great mom who's always said that to me too, like do you, she always says that. But it's important for us to know that, especially even in this movement because sometimes there's an expectation among feminists that the next generation is just gonna let you slide on in and like bring in your new ideas and that sort of thing and that's not necessarily how it's gonna be. So I love that rookie kind of set that example and they said we're willing to bet on making less money to start to own this and to own it on our terms and so that's just something that um, I think is really great and I'm seeing these young entrepreneurs who are also engaged in that scene and social media thought leaders who are really starting to make that um, turn that into sustainable action and it's really beautiful to behold so you have any other questions Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for your comments. My name is Ari Kan, and my question for you all is, you have young adults, young people, who are outside of the traditional work environments, power structures, and people who are trying to ascend in their careers and think that's too much of a boulder to break down. I can't be in this predominantly sexist corporate community. So there's people that make that decision. And then there's people who are involved in that and then feel as though their beliefs are challenged and don't know how to bogart through the corporate environment that they're in and maybe don't feel they have that voice or don't know if they want the CEO position mm -hmm. and the years to get there in order to have that voice. Mm -hmm. What advice do you give to someone trying to make those decisions whether to be in or out and then what you do when you're in? Let me take that one. Okay. Let me take a really stab at that. <laughs> um, I, I think you have to know, you have to know yourself, you have to know what you want to do, and you have to, you have to feel really comfortable in that. So I have been at Planned Parenthood for 10 years, and I remember being told by a dear friend and mentor in the, in the womanist movement, mm. um, she told me, You'll know who she is, I probably when I describe this, but I don't want to call her out. But she told me when I first started, she's like, you just wait, and eventually you will get tired of those white folks. And when you do, come talk to me. And even though I admire this woman greatly, I found that to be the most patronizing thing that anyone has ever said to me. Um, because I made a deliberate choice of where I wanted to work and what I was willing to do in order to make change. Some people make change from the outside, and that is extremely valuable. We need those warriors out there. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely 100% legit. Some people make change on the inside, mm -hmm. and that is the path that I've chosen. 
Um, it is a path that's worked for me. It's what I felt comfortable doing, and I feel like I've been successful in that. Um, so you just kind of have to know, and even in the, in the face of people who are allegedly on my side, really not supporting me in that, in that decision. Um, I remember, it was just a few years ago, it was after you left Jamia, when I looked around at the, you know, I work in organizing and advocacy, and I looked at our, um, our DC office, and I was the only woman of color doing programmatic work. It's the only woman of color not that that was a that wasn't in a support role and I was like that's insanity um, and I have worked with our leadership and I can't take full I mean I'm not taking total credit here I mean we have had leadership transitions and it's been um, that also helped facilitate that but that is a path that I chose I wanted to I wanted to do that from within and I think that the organization is better for it and I have grown as a person mm. I just wanted to Thank say you. yeah that was awesome Thank you, Carol. Um, well, first, I want to say your shirt's amazing. Yes. Let's just get that out of the yes. way. Yes. If you can't see her shirt, you should later because it's like <laughs> she's killing it with a shirt. Um, but I also wanted to just make sure that we don't talk about those things as dichotomies because mm -hmm. the future yeah. of work structure is totally breaking mm -hmm. apart. And by the year 2020, 50 percent of our workforce will be freelance. Um, I happen to already fit into that category. So I work in the belly of the beast. Um, I do strategy work for TED. Um, the Aspen Institute, some of the most like wha m white male dominated spaces in existence. And I also consider myself someone who does a lot of radical grassroots work. And, and so traveling between those two spaces is really interesting. And, and I think more and more of us are going to be doing that in and out stuff. And so we have to constantly be kind of code switching and strategizing and figuring out where our energy is best used and how we can kind of infiltrate some of those institutions and do good work and still hold on to our radical roots. And so for me, that is the real question and struggle. And I think for more of us, that kind of hybrid model is, is what we're trying to go for. Can I just yes, say one please. thing? I'll say um, that logistically, um, what they said, yes. And logistically, um, working in communications, people always want to go to the tactics. So start with your goals, right? Like think about like what it, so making this decision, like what is, what is it that you want to, you aspire to do and how can you get there? So develop your goals, think about your objectives and then the tactics that are going to get we, you where you have to go because we typically jump to like the thing. So, you know, using Facebook for online activism as opposed to like I aspire to break down structural sexism within the workplace. How are you going to get there and how can you logistically put that on paper or determine like a life plan for yourself and something that you can ask the people, mentors, any of us, um, how do I develop that and how can I get to where I need to go using it? And yeah. so before I just ask the last question, which will be a closing question, um, is that I just want to say thank you so much for all of your candor and um, just, this is the kind of thing we need in the movement to really speak those things um, that are important. Um, just I, I think that one of the pieces of advice we were talking about, just advice from Gloria, because she is just so amazing. I think she's one of those people who has um, just like the visionary mindset to be time, to be ageless, timeless, and just like one of those people who just has that vision to tr trust. She doesn't even like the word mentor. She always says, don't call me that, I'm your partner. Um, and I love that about her. But one of the things that she said when I was telling her that I was leaving Women's Media Center to go to TED and I was worried about kind of leaving the feminist cocoon and all of our brouhaha's as we talked about it to go to an organization with mostly white men and at that time there were no other black women in that office when I was there. Um, something she said to me was, while I'm really sad to lose you, it's really important to have people like you showing up as a feminist at places like TED, and in some ways strategically more important than having you within a feminist organization. And so while we're sad to lose you, I think it's important to have us in these organizations where those perspectives are being brought in and you can introduce them. And that was really powerful for me, and I've really thought about that a lot, about opting in. Someone said to me the other day, a young woman of color who had been in nonprofit had said to me, you know, thank you for opting in. And I thought, oh, wow, wow, interesting. And she's like, yeah, thanks for opting in. She's like, you know, you know the terrain and everything, and you're opting in, and that's, that's good for us. We, you know, we need more of that. And so I just wanted to share that as well to say that even if you're in a corporate environment like you just spoken about, woman with the wonderful shirt, um, that <laughs> you can show up as you, and you showing up as you actually creates a paradigm shift, yeah. even though sometimes it can feel really scary, and you're not getting that validation in that moment from people who don't get it. 
but don't see, but you know that like maybe they're not credible sources and maybe if you know what's right and it feels righteous to you and you're doing it, let the chips fall where they may because you might have made that change that they just might not be ready to appreciate right then. Right. Right. Yeah. So thank you for saying that. Yeah. Yeah. So our last question of the day and it's so sad. Hi, Rocio. Hi, everyone. My name is Rocio Cordoba. I'm with the Ford Foundation. And thank you all. Incredibly inspiring. Um, I have a question about sustainability mm -hmm. for online feminism. Mm -hmm. How, you know, you all mentioned uh, in different ways the need for support, the need for resources. How do you avoid that third shift? Mm -hmm. What can um, allies with resources, and I'm not just talking about monetary resources, with other kinds of resources of support, really be allies to the movement um, and to support its sustainability so that you can all do the um, fierce activism that you're doing. Thank you. And thank you for that question. We love that question. <laughs> Well, I will plug, we really did write a paper on this <laughs> that sort of, uh, speaking of feminist brouhaha, got a little bit like lost in the shuffle. Um, but there was a collective that met, this is the genesis of Fem Future, that talked about these sustainability issues. Um, we created this paper in an attempt to ask that question and, and entertain some potential solutions. Um, it wasn't particularly effective in certain ways, but I, I think there is this, this paper that exists and this attempt at that. So people can see it online. Um, very easily. So, so some of the things we came up with were: Are there ways to create, for example, pitch sessions where, like, you know, it's it sort of Kickstarter in person, but online feminist organizations could come in front of people again, and I'm interpreting very strictly monetary resources could come in front of people with monetary resources and say, "Here's something we want to do in the next year," um, and do sort of a rapid pitch session, have people throw resources towards the projects or the organizations that they think are doing the coolest work. Because for me, I think the biggest obstacle is still our social class segregation that exists inherently um, in our lives makes for this, this sort of missing each other kind of thing happening. And if we could get all those folks in the room, and maybe it wouldn't be monetary resources, maybe it would be I know how to incorporate or I know how to create a nonprofit, let me do pro bono lawyering for you or whatever it is. Um, getting more of those kind of structures in place. I, I have this fantasy of like a once a year thing or a once a quarter thing where all those people would get in a room. And, and they do this in the film world, by the way, like because there's been so little funding for film. I've actually been to one at Ford where, you know, young women filmmakers say, I want to make this film and people with resources give them money to do it. So part of it for me is how do we create structures where we break down the organic class segregation that exists and of course race segregation and all other kinds of sort of organic social segregation that we all live with, um, age segregation, so that we create those. Um, the other thing is just helping online feminists learn more about the different kind of structures they can use for their organizations. Nonprofit isn't necessarily the answer, right? There's a really important critique of the nonprofit industrial complex. Um, but what, it, what would it look like to try to make profit? Um, it's really tricky in a world where you're basically trying to send people away from your page to other less known bloggers and, and a way to go sign a petition, you're not trying to trap people on your page, which is how like massive media conglomerations make money is trapping people on sites, right? So there's all sort of complexities to it, but in that paper we tried to entertain some of it. I'm gonna chime in, um, and I have a lot of feelings about this question, because <laughs> uh, I'm an executive director of a young online feminist organization, um, and so here's, the scenario, right? So, real talk, Hollaback um, is in 71 cities and 24 countries and 14 different languages. We have three staff. We have an organizational budget of $300,000 a year. Um, and it's not so much about leveraging the non-monetary resources. So um, in kind every year, um, we get in kind love from every direction possible. Um, we have about $300,000 of in kind love that comes in through law firms and brand firms and all this kind of stuff per year from people who believe in what we do. Um, we are 80% funded by young people under the age of 25 that are donating five, 10, $25 to the work that we're doing. Wow. And in addition to that, in addition to the three staff that we have, we have about 
400 site leaders around the world that are not paid to do the work that they're doing. So we have a staff of, you know, like 403 and three of us are paid. Um, there's nothing cool or okay about that. And there's nothing that, you know, leveraging um, pro bono work, uh, you know, is going to do to really fix that. Um, it is an issue that unfortunately comes down to money. But what I do want to say about that is that um, I, I find solace in the fact that we are not alone, that revolutions, when they start, are never funded, that in 60 years, you know, when all of these young feminists that are funding the work that we have are, are you know, planning their, you know, long-term giving and their wills and all this kind of stuff, Hollaback will be loaded, and it'll be great for whoever the executive director is then. Um, but we're not there right now, unfortunately. Um, we're in this place where we're funded by the target audience that we're trying to reach. Um, we're not in an unusual place, but look, there's no portfolio on online feminism. There's no portfolio on feminist social entrepreneurship. There's no portfolio on, you know, uh, street harassment. Um, and so we're constantly, so much of the work we have to do is not just to advocate for the change that we want to make, but to advocate from change within those funding systems, um, which is why I was so excited about, you know, the report that Courtney um, and Vanessa and Jamia and Samita, you know, came out with the Fem Future report to start to kind of change some of those those power dynamics. But um, we're not alone. It's not an unusual situation, but it does really, really, unfortunately, suck. So, <laughs> we also have to foster a, um, an environment of collaboration. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things that continues to happen is people are starting new projects, which is fantastic. Feel empowered um, and feel innovative, but also talk to people around you about what they're doing and perhaps collaborate. And I think what ends up happening is that people, folks with resources, um, create a, a, a kind of an air of competition among people. So you have to start your own thing so you can take ownership over that. So it's about checking our egos too at the door. Can I collaborate with Courtney? Can I collaborate with Shelby? Can I be in space with them and decide to do something together as opposed to having to start my own thing and say, this is Chanel's thing. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be that. And I think people with resources should encourage folks, oh, I heard that somebody in Utah is doing a thing that somebody in New York is doing. Let's connect them. And so creating a well-connected network of innovators and entrepreneurs and also engaging people who work within organizations to think outside of their organizational model. We have to engage individuals who are, mm -hmm. whose primary responsibility is, is to leverage their organization's mission and vision to think about gaps that they see in the movement and push that outward and, so, and be inspired to innovate on ideas that already exist. Um, we're not really creating new things. We're really just moving on, on constructs and ideas that already exist. And so engaging in collaboration with people that you care about and people that you trust is also going to help us, I think, consolidate resources and increase capacity. And capacity increasing um, opportunities for organizations and individuals is something that people with resources can do too. You know, so not necessarily always money, but like how can we help increase the capacity of hollow back? How can we make it so that um, that some of those folks are getting some kind of monetary compensation um, or can we consolidate in a way where everybody gets what they need, whether it's monetary or otherwise? Thank you so much for your question and also for all of you for staying to the very end. We've had a wonderful time with you. Thank you for making my first YTH Live amazing and thank you to all our panelists for all of your wisdom join the conversation we want to hear your voices too uh, we know that our vision for the future of online feminism is not complete and we know that your voices need to be included as well and we're hoping with the rapid fire tweets that you're going to be sending that people in your communities will also be joining the conversation as well and this is just another way that we can keep this conversation going so thank you so much and stick around to go to some of the online networking sessions if you don't have to catch a plane right away and have a great year until we see you next time stay engaged and stay in touch thank you yeah.